check, check. There we go. Hey, there we go. As I was saying, welcome to First Baptist Church of Norristown. Make sure you have two eggs for yourselves. They are on your chair. I know it seems weird. We just had Easter, but uh, I promise there's a point to it. And uh, make sure you have two of them. And don't want to put them up or anything like that. Just keep them closed for now. All right, we're going to stand up. We're going to sing. We're going to sing a new song called River of Life. We'll have to keep going. Sorry about that. All right, we're going to have to play with that. And Chris will work his magic. This song is called River of Life. The persistence, come on down to that river. Guaranteed you'll never be the same. There's a fountain flowing from the heart of the Savior. Bring your sins in all your guilty states. And that river of life washes all.
come before you today just acknowledging that you are many names. You are our way maker, our miracle worker, Lord. The promise keeper in our lives, the light in that darkness. Lord, you have bestowed upon us an energy and a love and a joy that we just want to lift to you today. And we pray all of these things in ways that you have taught us as well as your son Jesus Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. The Spirit invites us today to hear our Father speaking these words over us as we offer ourselves to him via the call to worship. Our call to worship this morning is labeled All Invitations to Live from hymn number 325. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the riches of fare. O oh God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my body longs for you in a dry, weary land where there is no water. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you, my soul will be satisfied. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Amen. Amen. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thought. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to God for he will freely pardon. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him hear say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Amen. Amen. This portion of our service, we recognize our gifts that we give to our Father. Ascribe to the Lord, in Psalm, 90, Psalm 96, verse 8, reads, Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts. Let us present the one who is worthy of all with the tithes he commands and the offerings he deserves. You can give online at our website, firstbaptistchurchnorriston.org, by clicking the link that says tithes and offerings. You can also place your money in the monetary gifts in the uh, plates outside of the door. At this point in time, I'd like to uh, pray for over our offerings. Father God, we praise you for all that you do. We praise you for allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us into happy givers. We ask that you bless these gifts and the givers as we use these funds to better your kingdom here in Norristown and throughout wherever our missionaries serve. We thank you for this church and the many hands that work to make this a loving church, a church that resembles your son, Jesus. Continue to bless us as we listen to your word from our shepherd, Pastor C.G. Thank you for touching his heart as he shares the message of touch this morning. You are an awesome God, and we are so blessed to be called a child of God. Amen. You are welcome in the house of the Lord, and we delight. We are, we are delighted that you are here today. If you're a guest today, we ask that you simply fill out the green card located in the pew in front of you. Um, fill out as much information as you're willing, uh, and we'll, we'll do our best to reach out to you. 
At this point in time, we'd like to touch on some of the connection points that are happening here at First Baptist. The first item is the World Vision. Today is our World Vision monthly offering to support three children who have benefited from our generous gifts over the years. Uh, donation envelopes are located next to the plates. Feel free to fill one out. The next item is for the church potluck today. Yeah, daddy. I saw lots of good grub coming in, so make sure you're, you're available to hang out for the um, potluck. If you didn't bring anything, that's all right. There's plenty of food to be had, so make sure you come on out and, and <clears throat> support the potluck. We have a new members class starting. You're right. So Pastor CG will preside over this new members class that will start on May 17th. What's that, Thursday? Tuesday. Tuesday at 7 p.m. <clears throat> if you're interested, please contact Pastor CG or, or Miss Leslie, because I think she's teaching as well, right? Oh, sorry. Next item is the First Baptist Church Spring Festival. So that'll be on Saturday, June 11th from 8 to 1. Uh, if you're interested in, in hosting a table, please reach out to Tom, um, and he'll arrange for you to, to get a table for the flea market. Uh, the outreach group is also collecting gently used jewelry uh, to sell at the festival. The proceeds will benefit the outreach group. So it looks like we're going to have artist bands, Wendy Shedding, Oh, is that the performer? All right, I got it. Sweet Mercy Band, uh, First Baptist Kennett Square, Central Baptist, and FBC Praise Band. Man, you guys got a whole line up there. That's cool. I'll definitely be there for the coffee bar in the morning. Uh, chicken barbecue tickets will start next week, so you can see any of us for, for the chicken barbecue tickets. Um, and anything, I think that's it for the, nope. Oh, the sign-up sheet. That's right. Very good. So we need some helpers for the chicken barbecue. So we'll have this sign, um, the sign-up sheet up front. Um, we're looking for three cooks for the AM shift and the PM shift. We also need some food runners, again, for the AM and the PM shift, and a cashier for the morning and the uh, afternoon. No experience required. No experience required. Even for the cooks. Because I am your guidance. I will make sure that you own it. But seriously, if anyone's available to sign up to make this thing work, make it roll, that'd be fantastic. Um, also, with regards to committee and sub member, uh, committee and subgroups, property and finance will be meeting on Wednesday here at the church at 7 p.m. If anyone's interested, come on. All right. Can the children come one up? Oh, you like my shirt? You like that? Nice. This old thing. So if you're a child, come on up. I have a question to ask you. Have you ever heard the joke about the starving little boy? Did you ever hear the joke about the thirsty little girl? Well, that's right, because there's nothing funny about a starving little boy and a thirsty little girl, right? There's nothing funny about that. If you don't have enough food, you could starve and die. If you don't have enough to drink and you're thirsty, you could die. Now, Jesus says that we don't only live by bread that we eat for our bodies. We also live by every word that comes from God. And what does that do? The food feeds our bodies, but the words from God feed our soul. Now, have you ever seen somebody with a hungry soul, with a thirsty soul? They might be sad. They might be angry. They might have their heart broken. So we come here to have our souls fed. Now, we have a big potluck for later where we can feed our bodies and get some toothpicks and everything and eat a little bit later. Ha, ha, ha. But right now, right here and in kids' church, we feed our souls by the words of God. 
So come to the potluck right now. We have love over here and grace over here and truth over here and peace over here. And you can feed your soul. And that will make you so much happier than a full belly. Full bellies are good too, though. All right? Now, everyone, please extend your hands to the children and let's bless them. Lord God, we thank you for these little ones who you have given to us. We pray as we give them back to you, that you feed their souls, feed their little hearts. Give them your love, your truth, your joy, your peace. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. You're off on your way. Because we come now time to our praises and our prayer requests. I make sure to write them down. I pray over them weekly, or I should say daily. And I hope you're able to maybe write them down yourselves. Put it on a place you know, like, uh, like your fridge or your mirror. <clears throat> That's what I usually do. I put it right on my desk. Oftentimes people see that. And um, yeah, there's, there's lots for us to pray. I think the first one before we get to um, everybody here in the sanctuary is we need to pray for Buffalo right now. Um, you probably saw the, uh, the mass shooting that happened uh, yesterday, last night. Uh, Ten dead, three wounded as of lately. And it was an act of racism. And so... We are devastated to see that once again, our world is not at peace and not of one of love, especially for our brothers and sisters um, of the many races that make up America. So um, we need to be praying for those that have suffered the losses, the families, for the shooter. We need to pray for, for him as well. Dear, world, dear God, our world is, um, is hurting right now. Our country is hurting. We see racism rear its ugly head once again in Buffalo. We pray for those that are suffering the loss of those that have died from needless hate and anger. We pray for those that are wounded that they are able to be healed. Pray for those doctors and the nurses that are taking care of them. We pray for the the police officers, the detectives that will be handling this horrible case, that they will have to interrogate the person who's so angry that they needed to shoot others needlessly. Lord, <clears throat> I can't place myself in the shoes of those that are going through that, but we know that they are in the right shoes, they are in the right place, and we pray for our leaders both locally and for our nation that have to make the tough decisions to continue this world forward, to continue our country forward in a sense of peace and justice and social sensibility. Lord, there are so many people that are suffering right now, those that have lost loved ones very suddenly, those that are getting ready for their next journey into the life with you, Lord. We pray for family stability in all of that. We pray for those interested in our new membership class coming up. So happy to see the many faces that will be with us on Tuesday night as the new membership class begins. We pray for our potluck that we can be uh, able to open up the doors not only to those here in the sanctuary, but to those in our community, Lord. We can invite others over for a bite to eat, because I'm sure there's a lot of food that we, can, that we can offer to others. We pray for the health issues that are on many of our minds. Pray for understanding and sensibility in all of this. There's so many more that we're thinking of right now, Lord. So we just take this moment of silence to lift those concerns, those places, those names, all up to you now, Lord. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. So we've been doing a new series for the past couple of weeks. For those that are new to it, it's called The Senses of Prayer. We've been trying to understand where God is in the midst of all of our prayer needs in the senses that we have. 
you know, uh, what was it? What was the first week? Does anybody remember what the first week was? Sight. Sight. We talked about um, how we how we see the the face of God in our lives to connect with Him on a very personal level. And then last week, what did we talk about? Smell. smell. Yes. How smell can trigger memories in all of us, and it does so the same for God. We can create pleasant memories of ourselves in God's mind. And together, we're going to learn that. Let's say this together. We must pray in all times, all senses, and all ways, at work, at school, at home, and at leisure. God bless you. Today, I'd like to talk about our sense of touch and how we can apply that to our prayer life. The easiest way to do that is to get a bit hands-on today. They say multi-sensory talks are are the most engaging messages for public speaking where where the audience is receiving the message through an auditory means. Obviously, we hear what's what's being said. Visually, obviously, we have it up here on the screen, things that are projected. And also, it becomes physically active. You know, maybe you get the audience involved in some way, in a very direct way with the speaker's message. And I think the same method can be applied to our our daily talk and our daily walk with God. It reminds me of blessing a home. Here's a picture up here of our house blessing that many of you came to when we moved back in November to our new home. I was very thankful that our, our one and only Chris Davis, and he's probably out preaching at another church right now, but uh, our one and only Chris Davis is able to bless our home by placing his hand on the outside structure itself while praying. It was a small but very important act. I remember blessing <clears throat> other homes, others' homes, in past churches myself. Uh, in a similar way, I took the opportunity you know, to go to every room and every corner of the house so that I could physically touch every space that I was making sure to bring the name of God into that place and to keep it holy. So I was very thankful that Chris did something similar with us. It also reminds me of these eggs that we stuffed for our Easter egg hunt just about a month ago, which I'm sure you all have right now. Um, Very hands-on sermon today. Uh, About a month ago, we stuffed these. We stuffed over, I think, a thousand eggs. Is that right, Gary? Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah, almost almost 2,000, maybe 1,700, something like that. Um, I I know your wife was able to count all of them, so I'm thankful for that. (laughs) And we had plenty left over. As you can see, we, we handed two of you Uh, two of them to you all each today. When we stuffed these eggs, we thought about the many kids that came to this church, most likely for the very first time, and how we wanted to be able to bless them. But but certainly, we couldn't do that all at once on one day. We wanted to touch them in a a very small way by giving them an egg or two or 20 or 100. (laughs) So I wanted to do it again today for you by giving you each an egg for you today. One is for you. The other is for someone that's on your mind that's not here today, okay? I want you, as you listen to the the purpose of prayer and how our sense of touch affects that, I want you to essentially, you know, give a quick prayer over that egg and bless someone with it this week. God knows that your love radiates for these people through the touch, through your touch. And so I believe that your love will feed into that egg as well. Before I begin, begin I wanted to uh, give you a quick story that I, that I found, and it's pretty funny. Uh, there was a pastor who had a parrot one time, and all the parrot would say was, let's pray, let's pray, let's pray. So the, parrot, the pastor tried to teach him to say other things, but to no avail. He learned that one of his other church leaders also had a parrot. And his parrot would only say, let's kiss, let's kiss. Okay? So the pastor decided to invite the leader and his parrot over uh, over to his house. And when the leader arrived, they put the parrots into that same cage and 
just, you know, to see what would happen. So the leader's parrot said, let's kiss, let's kiss, let's kiss. And the parrot's, the, the pastor's parrot said, thank you, Lord, my prayers have been answered. <laughs> I know, that's a cheesy joke. (laughs) But we can learn from this. Prayer can be answered through actions, just like our parrot believed. We see this in our passage today. So I encourage you to open up your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 8, verses 40 to 48. You can find a pew Bible for yourself, or maybe it's on your phone or your tablet, wherever you take notes, because there's some real great vital stuff in here. I'll wait for an amen when you have that. Amen. So yeah, uh, there was a bit of a typo in the bulletin. It's, It's verses 40 to 48 that we'll be looking at. Now Jesus saw a woman who was very desperate to achieve her prayer by getting into action. You see, Jesus also believed in the fact that prayer can be effective just through touch alone. We look at our scripture today and we find that by this time, here's some context for y'all. By this time in Jesus's ministry, the people, well, they were following him everywhere that he went. They were there they were, uh, there were times that he even had to launch himself out into a boat just to teach to the multitudes of people. Okay, so imagine that for a second, that you're just inundated with a lot of people. There were thousands of people who would follow him in a desert looking for healing or just look, listening to him. They want to hear what he had to say. Now, wherever he went, people would be pressing upon him, literally, physically pressing upon him. He could hardly move. And that's where our verse picks up, with verses 40 to 42. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. So Jesus comes into this city, and, and the people there waiting for him, hey, good to see you, Jesus. We're introduced to a a man who is a ruler of the synagogue at the time. This meant that he probably had the highest authority in the entire city. It also meant that he was, that since he was approaching Jesus, he was risking his entire rulership and his respect of the other religious leaders there. Yet, he had a sick daughter. You think about what you would do for your kids, right? You would do anything. And here she was lying, just dying. And it's, it's interesting to see his approach, the things that you would do for your own children. He fell down on his face, and he was begging Jesus, please, just come. Just come to my home. He knew that if he could only get Jesus to his home, his prayers would be answered. Verses 42 to 43 talks about someone who crosses paths with Jesus while on his way to help this girl. It says, as Jesus was on his way, <clears throat> the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. So this, <clears throat> this new woman, was she had spent everything on, on, on getting better. She had, she had no other way to do this, but she, she actually grew worse from the, the things that she was trying to do. She had most likely spent everything that she had to get out of her plight. She was probably taken advantage of by many. This woman had experienced an issue of blood for 12 straight years, as this this same story is found in Mark chapter 5. We have to remember that this woman was more than just a character on the flat page of the Bible. This is an actual person. During this time, she had nothing but pain and chaos, and discouragement. During the same 12 years, though, Jairus had had hope, had joy, and excitement over the birth and the growth of his own daughter. Their needs were driving them both to their only answer, Jesus. According to the law, the woman's disease had made her unclean. It's stated in Leviticus chapter 15. 
This was not because of, a, a, of her monthly period, as the passage explains. Because of her uncleanliness, three important things would have been taken from her. One of the things from her that would have been taken was her religion. She would have been excommunicated. She could no longer take part in the worship with God. She was shut out from the temple, and she was shut out from the synagogue worship because of this uncleanliness. The second thing that was removed from her would have been her family. She would have been divorced from her husband if she had one, according to the teachings of Halal. Her family would have been broken up because they could not live in that, in that home while she was unclean. You know, it's one thing to be unclean for a couple of days, but to go on to continuously for 12 years would have been considered unclean for good. Anything that she touched became unclean to them. And if others touched her, they themselves would become unclean. Her children would have been taken away from her if she even had any. And then the third important thing that would have been removed from her is her social life. She would have been ostracized from society. She could have no social contact in the marketplace or in any other social setting because of her uncleanliness. No doubt, she was experiencing pure agony in her life, physical, mental, social, and spiritual agony. Twice in the scriptures, her disease was called a plague. The Greek word has the connotation of the word whip, okay? Just as a whip, her disease drove away her strength and deprived her of motherhood and all of her possessions. All the wealth that she had possessed hadn't helped her, for she had spent it all, and it only grew worse. She had followed all of the cures that were prescribed by the doctors at hand. The Talmud, which is the, the body of Jewish civil and ceremonial law, indicates that there were 11 such cures for her. She had paid for each one, and she followed them meticulously. And it kind of makes you think, <clears throat> what remedies are you using to meet the needs of your life? Medicine and counseling, that's one thing to trust. But I worry for those who put their trust in their friend's advice over the advice that we take for granted from the Word of God and through prayer alone. We see that she had grown worse even after following all the advice of those that she had put her trust into. Who or what do you put your trust in these days is what you need to ask yourself. So, she had finally had enough of it all. She heard about Jesus, heard about his miracles. <clears throat> She's desperate. And here we find her saving grace in verse 44. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Immediately that fountain of blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that affliction. Have you ever felt that way before? Maybe like a chronic pain or an agony in your life that you are suffering, and it just finally stops so abruptly? It's very rare, I know, but it can happen. And it's quite a blessing to feel all at once. It truly can feel like a miracle. The woman determined that she could not stay there. She couldn't stay where she was. Jesus was on his way with Jairus to respond to his need, but this lady pushed through the crowd and she believed if she could just touch the edge of his clothes that she would be healed. The single fringe well, it's caught the attention of the entire world. You have songs, you have poems, you have multiple sermons alike about this. Scholars believe that what she actually clutched was the tassel on his clothes. Ta tassels back then in the Jewish law were symbolic of the word of God. The, the strand stood for the Pentateuch, and the number of knots stood for the prophets at hand. By faith, she symbolically reached out and she clutched the word of God. At that point, healing virtue flowed through this symbolic manifestation of the word of Almighty God. Mm. 
Verses 45 and 46 continues. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Hmm. <clears throat> Jesus continually faced competing calls for his attention. Somebody's calling him, somebody's calling him, and he has to respond to them all. When a man of influence like Jairus approached him with the, with the urgency and the humility uh, to request help for his sick child, Jesus was, okay, I'm going to set out. I'm going to offer the assistance. Yet the ever-present crowd made progress difficult as we saw that he was literally crushed around by the people around him. Suddenly, though, in the midst of all the people around him, Jesus stopped and just said, who touched me? That's like saying that out loud in New York City. (laughs) Of course, many people had bumped and brushed up against him during that time, but Jesus, he sensed a different kind of touch. Someone had reached out in faith. And this reminds me of prayer alone. When you tell someone that you're praying for them, you, what do you usually do? You say, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you. Yeah, of course. Uh, you might remember their prayer, and you'll say that at the end of the day, or maybe you'll pray right then and there. But if you have a prayer partner in your life, maybe it's your spouse or it's a close friend of yours, uh, if they could just challenge us and say, but did you really pray for them? It's like, it's like they can tell the difference if you offered a few words of prayer to when you really set aside the time to pray for an individual. That's the kind of power that we're talking about. When Jesus even notices when the power flows out of him, that's the type of prayers that we need to be making. Uh, it reminds me uh, of just uh, of, of good friends of ours. Uh, Derek and Julie. They're getting married and we're really excited for them. Their, mar- their wedding is next Saturday. But they live all the way down in Florida, so we don't get to see them that often. We did see them a couple of weeks ago when we went down to Florida. And Liz was like, hey, we're going to pray for you. Um, your wedding's coming up. And they're like, yeah, thank you. We really appreciate it. And Liz was like, no, we're going to set a time. We're going to call you. We're going to zoom in with you. And sure enough, we just did it a couple of days ago. And Liz was like, I was like, Liz, you really... You think we, this is, uh, they're busy. They're getting ready for their wedding. They have time for prayer, CG. And I said, you're right, like you always are. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and we, we set a time. And we, we called them up and we prayed for them. We just said, hey, what's going on? How's the planning going? And they were so appreciative of that prayer. And, um, and that time was, was well spent. Here we are also seeing in our scripture We're getting a glimpse of what Jesus did when he approached the cross of Calvary at that moment. He's pouring out so much power for our pain and for our suffering. This is just a sliver of what physical pain that he will go through on the cross. This woman has suffered, yes, but she will no longer suffer. Yet Jesus is slowly walking towards the cross of Calvary. It's, it's, time, it's a time where he, he didn't want to go there. He's begging God to take it from him for he knew the ramifications of it all. And we've all been there before. Here's a, you know, I, I think of like a really random story <clears throat> for myself. I remember my elementary school days. In the winter, you get the days off and I'd be excited, but I'd also be anxious because I knew my parents were always setting up a time, probably like, like days after Christmas, my dentist date, <laughs> my dentist cleanup. And it, it never turned out anything bad, but I just got anxious about that because I knew it was coming up, um, yet, I, yet I knew it was coming. And that's, and that's kind of how I, how I think about it. Prophesied in Isaiah 53 and also repeated in 1 Peter, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that, free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Likewise, we see it in Matthew chapter 8. That evening they brought to him many who were possessed with demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and cured all who were sick. This was to fill, fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took 
our infirmities and bore our diseases. Finally, our passage ends with verses 47 and 48 that says, Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Notice that it says instantly healed. Why? Why did Jesus stop for her? The woman's healing had already occurred. He can keep going. Hey, you already got that power? Great. All right. On to Jairus, right? He can just keep going. I would do that to get, to get more done. But I think, but I'm not Jesus, right? <laughs> but I think, I think Jesus stopped to draw attention to her plight and her relief because she needed to realize that she wasn't an interruption or unimportant to Jesus. She mattered. She mattered, friends. She needed to hear someone call her daughter again to affirm her faith and to send her home in real peace. With his compassionate words, Jesus expanded and deepened her healing at that moment. And there are many people in our lives that need this kind of compassion. There are so many people within these very walls that suffer and that need that kind of comfort. There are many kids who picked up those Easter eggs only a month ago that need prayer. And there is someone that you have in mind that is suffering, who you plan to give that egg to, and that you're praying over right now. It's time we as a church reach out to the lost. Reach out to those that are hurt. And extend that same kind of compassion that Jesus gave this woman. Notice how Jesus doesn't even ask this woman, well, what's wrong? He just shares his strength. He shares the power to her, knowing that she needs it. We can learn from that, right? We can see when someone is really distraught about something in their lives. And we don't have to be like, well, what's wrong? We just say, hey, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Let me hear whatever you want to talk about. If you want to talk about sports, let's just talk about sports. If you want to talk about your favorite show, we'll do that. I'll gladly do that. If you want to talk about what's also on your mind, I'm here for that as well. We can learn from that. Jesus responded with action from a woman who acted upon her prayer. Now, the world often devalues good things by calling them unnecessary interruptions. But Jesus invites us to come to him like this woman did. He assures us that we will never be an interruption. He reminds us to trust in him. The timing of his response might seem odd, but we're not God, right? His timing is perfect. We can simply rest and live in his perfect compassion. And we can pass along that compassion by treating others as Jesus treats us. I think of when Logan, our three-year-old, wants our attention. He often will like pull at our shirt or our pants in hopes that we can just kind of stoop down to his level to give him our full attention. And he often just wants to say, hey, you want to play with me? That's usually what he asks. And that's the power of the fringe of clothes, it seems. As, the he as healing as it can be, it can also be a great source of power when it comes to our, our parents, whether our physical ones like our moms and dads or, or our spiritual one like our Father in heaven. So I ask you today, in what ways do you communicate to those around you that they are important? The sense of touch can be a really powerful one. We touch people's lives in both good and both bad ways in the midst of our prayers. We mean well, but we can often be viewed as a gossiper, right? When we pray with those that, that may be affected by our words. We need to respect people and not gossip about them as that can, that can touch their lives in a very negative way. After the woman in our story was healed, 
Jesus called her daughter. This is the only place in the New Testament where he used this term. Although she was excommunicated from the synagogue and from worship, she was now adopted into the family of God. Although she had been divorced from her husband, she was now taken to the heart of God. Although she had been ostracized from society, she was now inducted into heaven society. I challenge you today. Where are you today? This, this morning you may be sick in your body. <clears throat> this morning you may be sick on the inside. This morning you may have been praying and you've been praying and you're feeling like you're just interrupting God and you're getting in the way. It's time this morning to press through that. It's time to just touch God. Your prayer life can grow faithfully if you find the actions that need to happen to bring others to Christ and hold justice in this world as Jesus wants. So as we pray right now, I encourage you to pick up that egg that you're going to give to somebody. Hold it. And let's pray for them. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we reach out to your good and your loving ways. We try to touch you in the same way that you have touched us <clears throat> and brought us into your house. We recognize the peace and the understanding you continue to give us each and every day. Be with us this week as we reach out in compassion to those who are suffering. For we do this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So make sure you take those eggs and you give them to somebody who needs it. Is it your song called Goodness of God?
right now after the service. We hope you're really hungry. Don't forget to take that egg to someone who's in need of prayer. Then when they ask you, know, wow, why, why the egg? Why give me an egg? It's not Easter anymore. <laughs> you can just simply tell them that you're thinking about it. Stuff that egg. And you pray over that egg and you're praying for them. Hopefully you're able to do that. Maybe they're able to touch somebody in prayer in a very real and physical way with that egg. So, with that said, why don't I pray us for the food so we can get right to eat? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the food that you have provided for us and the many volunteers that continue to bless us here at First Baptist Church in Norristown. Uh, thank you for all the food that you have provided for us. And we think of those who might not have food today, Lord, and that we can reach out with compassion in a very real and physical way through the acts of prayer. <laughs> And maybe give that food to others that are in need of it right now. Um, in this week, today, wherever it may be, Lord, that we can give um, so that you can or so that you can see that uh, we're trying to live out the life that you have provided for us and that you have called us to. We thank you for the good fellowship and the good times around these tables today uh, while we eat. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.